All right, uh, hello everyone. My name is Emily. Uh, welcome to the Mini PCR Bio webinar series. Uh, Mini PCR Bio is a company that makes awesome tools for teaching science in the classroom. Um, but now that everybody's home, it's difficult for uh, everyone to access these tools. So we've created this webinar series as an alternative um, tool for teaching science in the era of virtual learning. Um, and today we're going to talk about CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. So what is CRISPR? It is, in essence, a revolutionary tool for gene editing. Um, and it, um, as you may be familiar, DNA um, contains the instructions for life. And since the um, structure of DNA was solved in the 1950s, scientists have developed a number of methods for gaining control over this molecule. Uh, ranging from being able to copy DNA um, over and over again, uh, just a particular piece of it to understand um, and analyze that piece, um, to being able to read the order of the A, T, Gs, and Cs, uh, the order of the bases called DNA sequencing, um, to even being able to synthesize our own DNA molecules. Uh, but changing the instructions, uh, these instructions for life, you know, particularly within a living cell, has been something that's been challenging. Um, Prior to, especially prior to CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. Um, so I've put a picture of a person throwing darts um, at a dartboard with a blindfold on to illustrate how things sort of used to work. Um, the methods that we used relied on the detection of really rare events. Um, and they were either technically easy to do, but fairly imprecise, or very, very technically challenging. And so uh, when CRISPR-Cas9 came along, people realized that this was easy to do. Most uh, labs have the tools to do CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing in their lab, um, and very, very precise. Uh, so it's totally revolutionized this field. So what is genome editing and why might you want to do it? Um, so there's a whole bunch of reasons. I'm just going to give a few examples. First is to understand the function of genes. We can um, edit the gene to disrupt its sequence, thereby preventing it from making a functional protein, and then study the cells to see what happens uh, when they lack that protein. And that gives us some clues as to what the function might be. Um, it also um, can be used to make transgenics. These are organisms that contain DNA sequences from other organisms. Um, and one other example of this would be taking a mouse gene and changing it to be more like the sequence of the human gene, making that mouse a better um, model for uh, studying human disease. Um, on a more applied side, the, it, you know, in agriculture, people are changing the DNA of crops and of livestock so that they have more desirable traits, um, such as drought resistance or cows that produce a particular protein in their milk. Um, and we're actually changing the DNA of real, live, living humans um, to treat different medical conditions, and we'll talk about that later on. Um, so just to give you an overview of where we're going today, we're going to talk about where this technology, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology, came from, how it works, and I'll give you a few examples of how it's being used. So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. This describes sequences that are found in the genomes of bacteria and archaea. Um, and I'm going to walk you through the word, or uh, through this phrase. It's actually easier to start at the end. Um, so we're going to start with this phrase, repeats. Um, that means DNA sequences that are repeated over and over and over again. Um, these repeats are short um, and palindromic, which means that they're red. When red, one strand is red in one direction, it's the same as the other strand being red in the other direction. In other words, the three prime to, or five prime to three prime sequence um, is the same on both strands. Um, and then these repeats are clustered, meaning they're near each other, but regularly interspaced meaning that they're not right next to each other. There's a, some random sequence in between them. Um, and that random sequence is called a spacer. And um, these sequences were first described by a Japanese scientist, Yoshizumi Ishino, um, who was working back in the mid-1980s. Um, and you know, that's quite a long time ago. It was around when I was born. Um, and um, he was trying to understand or to get the sequence of a particular gene in E. coli. And um, he uh, stumbled across these CRISPR sequences in the process of doing it. Back then, it was really difficult to get a sequence of a gene. Um, and so he just sort of happened upon, in this really laborious process, happened upon these uh, CRISPR 
sequences, and he was so intrigued by them that even though the work that he was doing and the paper that he was writing had nothing to do with um, these CRISPR regions, he wrote, described them in his paper because he was really curious about what they did. Um, and as it became easier and easier to gain uh, to get the sequences of um, genomes of bacteria and archaea, these sequences started to be discovered all over the place. So um, they've been found in about 90% of archaea that have been sequenced and about 50% of bacteria. They're really common. Um, and nobody really knew what they did um, until it was discovered that these spacer regions here um, contain, had homology or matched the sequence of viruses that attack bacteria. Um, so these viruses are called bacteriophage, um, or phage for short, and they're extremely common. There's many, many different types uh, and just many, many viruses floating around in the environment. So bacteria are constantly under attack um, from this type of infection, and they've had to been under evolutionary pressure to evolve ways of avoiding or, or fighting off um, these infections. And CRISPR uh, is derived from one of these mechanisms. So the way it works is when a phage infects a bacterial cell, um, the phage genes, the phage um, genetic information is chopped up, um, and a piece um, of these genes is incorporated into the CRISPR region in, in these spacers in between the repeats. Um, so here I've shown, you know, from the green phage, um, the sequence being uh, incorporated here, but you can see that the phage has many different um, sequences from different types of phage. Um, so it's sort of a record of all of the phage that it's encountered in its life. Um, when it gets infected again, um, this CRISPR region is transcribed into and processed into short CRISPR RNAs. Um, and each one corresponds to a different spacer region, so each one matches a different phage infection that's been found, uh, that this bacterial cell has encountered in the past. And if one of these CRISPR RNAs matches or has homology to the infecting phage uh, genetic information, it will help the cell uh, identify that phage and destroy it. Uh, the way that uh, the uh, CRISPR RNAs are helping to destroy. Um, the phage is um, using these proteins called Cas nucleases, and a nuclease is a protein that cuts nucleic acid. Um, and Cas9 is the one that's commonly used for CRISPR Cas9 genome editing. Um, so that's the one we'll be talking more specifically about right now. Um, so Cas9 makes a double stranded break when it cuts DNA. That means it cuts directly across both phosphate backbones. Uh, in the DNA um, to split the molecule in two. And um, it doesn't just do that anywhere. Um, it requires that the CRISPR RNA match the sequence of the genetic information that it's cutting. Um, so in the case of the phage system, the CRISPR RNA is going to match or have homology to the phage DNA, and then Cas9 will cut. Um, but what I mean, Cas nucleases or nucleases in general don't just cut phage genetic information. They can cut nearly any sequence, um, so long as an RNA is present directing them to that sequence. And that really was what gave scientists an idea um, to modify this technology. So back in 2012 and 2013, uh, scientists made modifications to Cas9 so that they didn't require these fairly complex CRISPR RNAs, but rather a much more simple guide RNA. Um, and these guide RNAs are fairly easy to synthesize in the lab. They're called guide RNAs because they're essentially guiding Cas9 uh, to the sequence that you want to cut. Um, and scientists can synthesize a guide RNA that matches a sequence, say in a mouse, um, and put that guide RNA and Cas9 into the mouse cell. Uh, and Cas9 will go and create a double-stranded break um, at the region that they targeted with their guide RNA. And obviously, creating a double-stranded break is not gene editing, um, but what happens is that double-stranded breaks are really detrimental to the cell. Um, you know, we use them as a mechanism to destroy a phage infection, right? That it, it's bad to have your DNA cut up. Um, and so eukaryotic cells have developed mechanisms to repair the DNA. And the scientists harness these mechanisms in order to be able to make the edits that they want to make at the region that they've cut um, using the guard RNA and Cas9. And so how does this work? Um, there are two different types of edits that one can create. Um, the first is um, simply to disrupt the sequence of the gene um, so that it's no longer able to make a functional protein. Um, this is called a knockout. And um, we, this relies on a mechanism of DNA repair called non-homologous end joining. 
um, or NHEJ. And this is just a really fancy way to say that the cell takes the two broken pieces of DNA and sticks them back together. Um, in the process of sort of sloppily sticking these two pieces of DNA back together, random bases are added or deleted at the site of the double-stranded break. Um, and usually adding or deleting bases into the sequence of a gene causes a disruption um, in this gene sequence and a knockout. Um, and while this is really useful um, for a number of approaches, such as studying gene function, um, it's fairly limited to just breaking things. So something else that you might want to do is take um, your gene of interest and actually alter the sequence in a specific way to change the function. And you can also use CRISPR or Cas9 genome editing to do this. Um, this relies on a different type of DNA repair. It's called homologous re uh, recombination. Um, and in this way, a DNA re is repaired using a template. So you may recall that many cells have two copies of each gene, um, or two alleles. And when this type of repair occurs, or these types of lesions occur um, in cells outside the context of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, what the cell will do is use the second allele to, um, to, as a template, to repair the sequence perfectly so that you don't have the mistakes that are, happen during NHEJ, um, but instead um, you get a perfect repair. However, scientists harness this mechanism um, to make the edits that they wish to make in a DNA to, to alter the sequence in a particular way by simply re providing repair instructions for the cell to use as a template. So they provide a DNA molecule that has the sequence that they want the gene to have. Um, and the cell uses that as a template for repair, um, and then the sequence is altered to change the function in a particular way. Okay, so we talked briefly about where this technology came from, it came from bacteria, um, and how it works, um, but how, it is, how is it used? Um, and I think I mentioned at the beginning this is a really revolutionary tool um, to say that you know, it's, it's revolutionized the field of biology research as a total understatement. So I was going to give you just a quick example from my own life. Um, I defended my thesis in the spring of 2013, so a little while ago now, um, and in the process of preparing to defend your PhD thesis, you sort of lock yourself away um, and just write up all the research that you've done um, you know, for the past too many years, um, and so you're not really paying attention to the rest of the world. Um, when you're doing this. And so I you know, locked myself away at the beginning of the year in 2013 and emerged a few months later, PhD in hand, and was having a conversation with another scientist. Um, and she mentioned something about CRISPR. And I said, what's CRISPR? And she looked at me like I had two heads because the early like sort of seminal papers describing CRISPR as a genome editing technique were published in January of 2013, right when I sort of sat down and started focusing on my thesis. Um, and in the intervening just a few months, everyone had realized how powerful this technology was and started to use it, uh, think about how to use it to answer the questions that they're interested in answering in their lab. So it, I could spend months and months telling you about all the cool applications of CRISPR that have happened over the last seven years. Um, but we decided to choose just two examples. Um, it says, in the interest of time. Um, and so the first is a much more applied example, um, treating a genetic disorder, sickle cell anemia. And then the second, um, is a more research type question um, that many PCR was involved in. Um, so let's talk about CRISPR gene therapy for sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder um, that's caused by a mutation, a single mutation um, in the gene um, that encodes one of the genes that encodes hemoglobin. So um, the normal allele has an A in the coding sequence, while the sickle cell allele uh, at a particular position, and while in the sickle cell allele has a T in the coding um, sequence at this uh, position. And that's enough um, to alter the function of hemoglobin um, and cause um, this disease sickle cell anemia. Uh, so he hemoglobin is a protein that is found in red blood cells, and it's used to carry oxygen. And red blood cells that contain the sickle cell form of Hemoglobin um, are stiffer, they're not as flexible, they tend to stick together, and they um, often have this sickle cell shape as shown here. Um, and this is problematic because the role of red blood cells uh, in the body is to travel around to all our cells and bring oxygen. And this involves um, squeezing through tiny capillaries in our body. Um, and um, you know, so sickle cell, uh, your sickle cell allele containing Red blood cells um, are stiffer, and they clump together, and they can't get through these capillaries quite as well 
Um, and so sometimes the patients will get blockages in their capillaries, and this leads to a lot of pain and over time organ damage from the oxygen deprivation that occurs um, as a result of these blockages. Um, however, you, this is interesting, you know, a unique um, disease in that you know, while every single cell in the body um, contains the mutant sickle cell allele, the only cells that are really impacted um, by this allele are the red blood cells. And blood is an organ in our body that we actually know how to replace. Um, so all of our blood cells, or most of them anyways, are made by um, what are called hematopoietic stem cells. These are special cells that are found in our bone marrow. Um, and in the process of developing treatments for bloodborne cancers like leukemia, we figured out how to replace a patient's bone marrow or do what's called a bone marrow transplant. Um, and we do this, we switch out the uh, unhealthy blood for healthy blood. Um, and so sickle cell anemia um, gene, CRISPR gene therapy actually relies on this process of um, bone marrow transplant. So what happens is you take a patient um, who has sickle cell anemia, you harvest their bone marrow stem cells, these hematopoietic stem cells, and you grow them in the lab. Um, and then um, you add the components for the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing system, so Cas9, and a guide RNA targeting the gene that you want to edit. And you might assume from what I told you on the previous slide that we were going to take the sickle cell allele and change the sequence so that it had the sequence of the healthy gene. Um, that's not actually what we're doing here. So it turns out that there's many different types of hemoglobin, many genes that encode hemoglobin in our body. And two of them have this really interesting inverse relationship. So beta hemoglobin, uh, represented here by the orange line, that's the gene that's mutated in sickle cell anemia patients. Um, and during gestation, you know, prior to birth, beta hemoglobin is expressed at really low levels. Um, and then uh, through, you know, starting just before birth and throughout the first couple of months of life, the expression level of hem beta hemoglobin increases, and it becomes the primary oxygen carrier at about three or four months of life. Um, during gestation, a different type of hemoglobin called fetal hemoglobin is expressed at really high levels um, in the developing fetus. It's the primary oxygen carrier in that case. Um, and then its expression decreases um, around the time of birth and, and through the first months of life um, to about 1% of the hemoglobin in your body. And fetal hemoglobin, because it's encoded by a completely different gene, is not impacted um, in patients with sickle cell anemia. It has a, the same sequence. And what we know is that there's a gene um, involved in turning off or turning down the expression of, of fetal hemoglobin. So what sickle cell uh, anemia gene therapy, CRISPR gene therapy involves is actually knocking out this gene that turns off fetal hemoglobin, therefore increasing the um, expression of fetal hemoglobin, uh, you know, up to levels similar to what's seen for beta hemoglobin. And this can actually treat patients and give them more functional hemoglobin in their body. So again, the way this works, we take a sickle cell patient um, and we harvest their bone marrow stem cells, we grow them in the lab, and we add the CRISPR components, Cas9 and a guide RNA targeting the gene that turns off fetal hemoglobin. Um, once we've knocked out that gene, fetal hemoglobin starts to become expressed in these cells. Um, and, we impl um, and in the meantime, the patient undergoes chemotherapy to destroy um, their existing bone marrow, and then we implant um, these hematopoietic stem cells back into the patient, replacing their bone marrow with edited cells. Um, and this is something that's actually being done in real life patients. This is Victoria Gray. She's the first patient in the United States to have received this treatment. And she, normally these patients are kept confidential, but she came out um, and um, gave an interview with NPR about her experience, um, and it's really it's a nice interview. We're going to link to it in the description of this video, um, and it's also linked in these slides. Um, so Victoria um, suffered from sickle cell anemia since she was an infant. It has a tremendous impact on her life. She was always in and out of the hospital and not really able to lead a normal life. Um, since undergoing the treatment, she has... Um, pretty high levels of fetal hemoglobin in her body, and she hasn't experienced the same symptoms she was experiencing before. She hasn't had to go to the hospital, um, and she's much healthier um, all around. So it's, you know, this kind of outcome is giving tremendous hope to this therapy being used in more patients. Um, and the other interesting thing to note here is that the change that we made to, that was made to Victoria's, um, hemo, or to Victoria's bone marrow 
um, is permanent. So this is the last treatment, potentially the last treatment that Victoria may need for her condition. So she doesn't have to continuously take medicine. Um, they've you know, made a change to her bone marrow cells and they hopefully will continue to produce fetal hemoglobin for the rest of her life. Um, so it's a really powerful treatment. You know, if it turns out to be everything um, that we hope it is, and, and certainly current signs are very positive. And just a quick note um, on the difference between this kind of gene therapy that I just described and CRISPR babies that you may have heard about in the news. Um, so in the gene therapy case, the only cells in Victoria's body that we changed the sequence of were the hematopoietic stem cells. So these just make blood cells. Um, that change that we made is not able to be inherited by any children that Victoria may have after having this treatment. Um, so it's really the changes isolated to her uh, and not passed down to any offspring and potentially, you know, doesn't have the potential to change the human race in any meaningful way. It just treats Victoria's condition. Um, that's really different from editing an embryo where every cell um, in the resulting uh, person's body would contain the edit and they would be able to pass on the edit to their children. Um, and so you may have heard in the news about two years ago, a scientist in China use CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to change the sequence of DNA in an embryo, uh, and that embryo resulted in the birth of twin girls um, that contain that edit. Um, and he did that without the knowledge um, of anyone at his institution or the approval of anybody at his institution anyways. Um, and he was widely condemned by scientists around the globe, and he's actually been sentenced to three years in jail in China as well. So this is something that we generally don't um, see as being useful. Um, and and, and it, uh, again, it's not um, particularly useful to all the patients currently living today with sickle cell anemia and other genetic conditions. You know, Victoria Gray is already born. Editing an embryo won't do anything for her. Um, and should parents wish to avoid passing on conditions like sickle cell anemia and other genetic disorders to their children, there's much simpler, much um, less risky approaches like gene, uh, genetic screening and genetic counseling that could achieve that same goal. So CRISPR babies, um, while they made a lot of news a few years ago, unlikely to be something that we see very much in the future. All right, so we talked again um, where CRISPR, or sorry, um, here we are, our, third, our last example, understanding DNA repair in space. Um, so this comes out of um, the genes in space contest. So those of you who may be familiar with genes in space, or many PCR may be familiar with genes in space, this is a science contest that uh, challenges students in grades 7 through 12 to design a DNA experiment for space. It's free. Um, it's available to anyone who attends school in the United States. Um, and it's a really fun activity to engage students in scientific thinking. The contest is open um, for about the next two weeks, so your students still have a chance to participate if um, this talk or any of the other mini PCR web, uh, bio webinars have inspired any um, ideas in their heads. Um, and the really exciting part is that the winning experiment is actually conducted on the International Space Station. So in 2018, the winning team um, was really interested in this idea of DNA repair in space. And um, the reason they were interested in this is because cosmic radiation can cause double-stranded breaks in DNA, the, the same DNA damage we've described earlier. Um, and some evidence suggests that in microgravity, our cells aren't able to repair those double-stranded breaks in the, quite the same way as they do here on Earth. Um, so this is doubly concerning for astronauts who may travel um, outside of Earth's atmosphere to the moon, to Mars, et cetera, um, as they were going to be exposed to a tremendous amount of radiation, potentially causing more damage in their cells, and they may not be able to repair it in quite the same way. Um, so the students, uh, but the, the interesting thing about cosmic radiation is that it causes um, these double-stranded breaks sort of at random throughout our genomes. Our human genome is three billion letters, so it's difficult for us to detect where these uh, mutations are occurring and follow what happens, uh, or where these uh, damage is occurring and follow what happens um, over time, how that's repaired. So what the students proposed doing is using the CRISPR-Cas9 system to create a double-stranded break in a controlled place um, so that we we're better able to track how those lesions are repaired in space and compare that to what's going on on Earth. Um, and 
uh, we did not choose to do this in humans, although that's the question is really how human cells repair DNA in space. Um, it's not ethical to take these sort of early stage um, experiments and, and conduct them in humans. Um, and there's only a few astronauts on the International Space Station. I don't think they would volunteer for this. Um, so we used a model system instead. Um, this is a, the, what we chose was an organism called Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, otherwise known as baker's yeast. So this is the organism that makes your bread rise. Um, and um, it's a single-celled organism that's really easy to grow and manipulate. So it's been used in the lab to study a whole variety of problems um, for a very long time, including DNA repair. Um, so DNA repair has been very well studied in yeast um, and making it a good model for this, uh, for this study. Um, we mentioned uh, you know, bacteria is also a single-cell organism that's really easy to grow and manipulate. However, DNA repair mechanisms in bacteria are, are much more limited um, and don't work the same way as they do in um, eukaryotic cells. So yeast was just a better model for studying the kind of DNA repair mechanisms that we wanted to look at. Um, the other nice thing about yeast is because it's been so well studied, we know the mutant phenotypes of most of its genes. Um, and this, we selected the ADE2 gene for our study, for um, our genes in space study. Um, ADE2, um, is, when mutated, turns the yeast red. And so uh, wild-type wild yeast are normally white or kind of yellowish, like I showed you in the picture earlier. Um, ADE2, to yeast with an ADE2 mutation um, are red in color. And why that happens isn't particularly important for this experiment. The reason we selected this is it gave a visual readout um, of the editing um, so that we could, you know, scientists here on Earth, um, the genes and space team here on Earth, and astronauts in space could just simply look at a plate and say whether or not um, these yeast cells had been potentially edited using CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. Um, so we flew uh, yeast cells to the International Space Station, and we um, also brought the components to do CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. And in space, we added them to the cell. So we added Cas9, we added a guide RNA targeting um, the ADE2 gene, and then we also added mutant repair instructions to ensure that the gene was edited and mutated in a, in a particular way. Um, and then we grew these cells on the space station and we looked to see whether or not the cells were white, suggesting that they hadn't been edited using CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing or oops, red, um, indicating that they had potentially been edited using CRISPR. Um, so this is astronaut Christina Koch. She's just added uh, these components, uh, CRISPR components to the cell. I should mention um, this was the first time that you know, adding these foreign components to a cell or transformation um, had occurred in space. And it was also the first time anyone had attempted to do CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing in space. Um, and so she's just done um, this fairly complicated technique on the space station. She's not a scientist. Um, she's got a member of the genes and space team talking her through these experiments on her headphones. And now she's adding the cells um, to the plates in order to grow them um, so that we can see their phenotype. And um, a couple days later, we looked at the plates, and you might be able to see um, we have three red colonies, um, indicating that you know, potentially the first successful CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing um, had occurred in space. And we followed up with, these, uh, with the cells and studied them using PCR and DNA sequencing and confirmed that they had, in fact, been edited using our, our meat and repair template. Um, so you know, this has been a really tremendous study because um, we've been able to take these complicated techniques and adapt them for use on the International Space Station. This opens up the possibility of more complicated research, say, to address the question that the students asked about how DNA repair occurs in space or and many other questions. Um, it, it sort of opens the door for these experiments to be done on the International Space Station. Um, we, it also occurred to us that, you know, if astronauts on the International Space Station could do CRISPR, potentially your students in the classroom um, could do CRISPR as well. So we've been considering adapting this experiment for classrooms, although we know that classrooms have their own unique challenges. Um, it won't be as simple as all that. Um, so I've given you two examples of how CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing 
um, is used to change the sequence of DNA. But another thing that people are interested in doing is actually modifying Cas9 nucleases or Cas nucleases um, to do things other than cut DNA. So one example of this is actually diagnosing coronavirus. Um, so in this system, uh, they use a Cas nucleus that's able to detect coronavirus RNA. Um, and then rather than cutting the, the RNA, which wouldn't be particularly useful for diagnostics, um, this protein's been modified to give a fluorescent signal when coronavirus RNA is present. Um, this technique has been adapted for use of actually many PCRs equipment. Um, so this is you know, fairly low cost, simple to use equipment um, that can be used to really um, say very, uh, detect um, coronavirus in a very sensitive way. So you can see this tube doesn't have any coronavirus RNA, um, but these tubes have increasing con concentrations and you get this really nice bright fluorescent signal. So um, you know, people are hoping to use this type of diagnostic in different settings where you know, low cost, easy to use tools may be um, advantageous. Um, and just to point out, this finding was reported um, just only a week ago. So this is really new um, and exciting uses of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology. All right, um, to give you sort of a walkthrough where we've come, gone today, um, we talked about how CRISPR-Cas9 um, gene editing technology came from studying bacteria and understanding their immune defense against um, bacteriophage infection. Uh, we talked about how it works using the cell's own DNA repair mechanisms to make edits to specific genes. Um, we talked about a few examples of how uh, this is being used for you know, treating sickle cell anemia, um, understanding DNA repair in space, and diagnosing coronavirus. Um, you guys had some more questions, um, so we'll go through those. The first um, was, when will CRISPR be used to cure a genetic disorder? Um, so we talked about how, in this talk about how CRISPR is being used to treat sickle cell anemia, um, which is a genetic disorder, and there's a number of other similar um, gene therapy type treatments um, in clinical trials at the moment. A lot of them rely on the same technique that I described about taking bone marrow um, cells, hematopoietic cell, stem cells out of the body, culturing them in the lab, and actually doing the editing outside the body. Um, so another example of that would be reprogramming your immune system to be able to detect um, and destroy cancer cells. Um, that's something that's in clinical trials. There's also a lot of interest in actually doing the editing within your own body. Um, so there are treatments for disorders of the lungs and disorders of the eye and some other different organs um, that are also in clinical trials. These obviously doing the editing within your own body is a little more challenging and a little more risky. Um, so they're, they're proceeding a little bit more slowly is my understanding, but uh, these are things to look out for in the near future. Um, what is the difference between a restriction enzyme and Cas9? I love this question. Um, so restriction enzymes and Cas, another word for restriction enzyme is a restriction endonuclease. So it's a nuclease, it's another type of protein that can cut uh, nucleic acid. Uh, Cas9 um, cuts, is directed, you know, directs, is directed to the sequence to cut using a guide RNA or a CRISPR RNA. Um, restriction enzymes, there are hundreds of different types. Each individual restriction enzyme recognizes a particular DNA sequence and only cuts at that particular DNA sequence. Um, so there's no RNAs involved. Uh, it just each enzyme is capable of recognizing a different um, short DNA sequence. Both um, mechanisms are derived from bacterial defenses against these bacteriophage, um, and both are really useful tools in the lab, but they just work slightly differently. One allows for genome editing, and one allows us to detect specific sequences when they're present and, and cut and recombine DNA in, in different ways. So um, what is a PAM? This is a term that you may hear thrown around when you're reading about CRISPR, or see thrown around when you're reading about CRISPR. Um, it is essentially, it's another thing that's derived from this defense against phage um, and bacteria. Um, the, and it's essentially a safety mechanism. So what may have occurred to you when I was explaining that um, is that the CRISPR RNAs, those, those short RNAs, um, they actually match or have homology to two different um, genetic sequences within the, an infected bacterial cell. So they match the phage sequence like we talked about. You know, if they're derived, if the bacteria had encountered that phage before and had incorporated some of that phage um, genetic material within 
its CRISPR region, then the CRISPR RNAs are going to match um, that phage sequence. But they're also going to match the CRISPR region from which they were transcribed. So, um, but it, bacteria don't, as we mentioned, have the same ability to repair their DNA um, that eukaryotic cells have. So it would be really, really bad for the bacteria to go around cutting up its own DNA. Um, and if you know, all Cas9 needed was for the CRISPR RNA to match the sequence, there's nothing to stop Cas9 from cutting the CRISPR region itself within the bacteria's own genome. So we don't want that to happen, or um, that would be detrimental for the bacteria. Um, so what a PAM is, um, it stands for protospacer adjacent motif. So protospacer refers to the sequence that matches the spacer region um, from the CRISPR uh, RNA or the CRISPR region. So it matches those CRISPR RNAs. Adjacent means next to, and motif is a DNA sequence. Um, so um, this is a DNA sequence that's next to um, the region that's matched with the CRISPR RNA. Um, and um, for Cas9, that sequence is NGG. So N meaning any nucleotide, guanine, guanine. Um, and if the sequence next to where the CRISPR RNA binds um, is NGG, then Cas9 will cut that genetic or that DNA. Um, if it's another sequence, Cas9 won't cut. So in the CRISPR region, um, the spacer is next to a repeat. The sequence in the repeat is not NGG, so Cas9 won't cut. Um, but in the phage genetic material, the CRISPR RNA binds there, and the next three nucleotides are NGG, so Cas9 will cut. Um, and that's something that you know, is a holdover from that system um, when you're editing, say, human DNA or mouse DNA, you have to design your guide RNA to be adjacent to an NGG sequence or adjacent to a PAM. Um, fortunately, that's a really short sequence. It's found throughout uh, in many, many places in our, our genome, um, and it's fairly easy to find one. Um, if for some reason the region that you want to edit doesn't have that sequence, um, there are other Cas nucleases that have different PAM sequences, and you might be able to use those instead. Um, and then most of you, almost all of you, <laughs> asked um, us what resources available for learning about CRISPR Cas9 genome editing in the classroom. Um, so I've put together a little list. It's in the description of the video. It's also in our slideshow. Um, so the first thing I've listed here is a DNA dot. So these DNA dots are put out by mini PCR Bio. They're free. Um, they are short, simple explanations of modern genetic techniques. Um, they are written by the curriculum team and they come with questions. They're a great supplement to your curriculum. And we have one on CRISPR. That's a really good resource for your students um, as they're learning about this technology. Um, and then I did some Googling and I found a bunch of things, but they are actually all summarized um, in this nonprofit's website, Unlocking Life's Code. Um, so if you go to that page, there's a whole repository of different resources, including uh, you know, an infographic. Um, thing that HHMI put together um, that includes a lot of interviews by scientists using CRISPR in different ways and a bunch of other really useful resources. Relevant to this talk, um, I've put a link to Victoria Gray's story um, about you know, her experience undergoing CRISPR gene therapy. Um, it's a really great interview. I encourage you to check that out. Um, I also put a link to the Genes in Space contest website. Again, the contest is open for another two weeks or so, and the submissions are due on May 9th. Um, so and it's a really great opportunity for your students to get involved um, in science. Um, you don't have to actually do anything other than come up with, uh, you know, do anything physically. You have to just think of a problem and, and write up a proposal. So it's a great thing your students can do at home um, and, and you know, really exciting thing for them to do, a really exciting, engaging thing for them to do. Uh, if you wanted to read more about this first CRISPR uh, genome editing experiment in space, I also put a link to NASA's website describing the mission. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about diagnosing coronavirus, um, I put a link to the, the preprint article describing the system. Um, and then finally, if you're interested in hearing about whether or not many PCR um, offers a hands-on CRISPR lab to do in your classroom, I highly encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. Um, you'll receive all of our updates, um, including all the new labs that we put out. Um, so I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your time and all the hard work that you are all doing um, to continue teaching science um, under 
virtual learning conditions. Um, and you know, hope that you found this useful today. Uh, we hope that you will join us next week for the next installment of our webinar series. Um, Dr. Alex Danis is going to be talking about quantitative real-time PCR. Um, this is the technique that's being used to diagnose CRISPR um, now here in the United States. Um, so it's a really relevant topic and um, she's also going to use some of the lab um, that we, we make on this topic. Um, so it'd be a great talk. We hope you'll join us. And again, thank you all for your time.